With more on all of this, we're joined by Anton Fedoshin. He's executive director at the Initiative for Russian Culture at American University here in Washington. Thanks so much for joining us. You just heard the admiral. Do you agree? Well, about the question of Ukraine, uh, not entirely. Uh, as your report mentioned itself, uh, the uh, majority of Ukrainians do not want to join NATO, and that majority increases exponentially when you go move towards the southeast, which is where the fighting is and which is the part of the country that opposes the current government. So it is by no means a clear-cut Ukrainian choice to join the organization. What do you think is going to come out of this NATO summit? Well, I think there are three things that are important. First of all, NATO is any military organization. Its raison d'etre is to increase its budget and stay out of war. And the current crisis in Ukraine is a great PR uh, sort of uh, situation for NATO to ask uh, for a greater funds. Number two, there's the business of the Middle East, which is the real threat and the real crisis right now. And then third is, a question, uh, of course, the question of, uh, of what to do with NATO. But it's interesting that, uh, um, that NATO and its relationship to Ukraine are the most vague part of this summit. There's not much that NATO can do. Ukraine is not part of the organization. But there will be a lot of very loud statements that will be made to make it look like NATO is doing something to help the Ukrainians out. Well, some of those loud statements beginning even before it starts, uh, the, the President of the United States, what do you make of his comments today? Well, he, uh, his comments are absolutely correct in that, uh, you know, he is uh, reinforcing the commitment that NATO members have made to each other, Article 5, to defend each other if one of them is attacked. The weird thing is that he has to make these statements. Uh, this is uh, an agreement that is part of the NATO Charter, which every member knows of. Um, the context for all of this is the request by the Baltic countries to have bases opened on their territory. And I have a feeling that the, um, the president's statement is a way to allay their fears, but a way to pad the disappointment that may be coming, and that will be that NATO bases will not actually open up on uh, Baltic territory, but we'll see. There's these accusations that the Russians have sent troops into Ukraine. There's now talk that uh, NATO may have exercises inside mm -hmm. Ukraine. Uh, there's ratcheting up of sanctions, ratcheting up of the rhetoric. Uh, no one seems to be looking for an off-ramp to try and stop this thing. Where do you see it going? Well, so far, the only, uh, uh, the only plan that has been tabled has come from Moscow, the, the seven-point seven plan that your uh, journalist mentioned uh, a second ago. The Ukrainians are still working on their plan, but they're supposed to be completed by the end of this week or next week. So far, the Russians have been the only ones to offer something concrete. Now, whether the Ukrainians agree to that or not is uh, up in the air. Ultimately, the country that pays the most for what's going on in Ukraine is Ukraine itself. And it's the economic fallout of the catastrophe that's taking place in southeast Ukraine that is going to be the determinant of what the peace looks like. No one seems to be thinking about the day after, but the real trouble will begin after the military conflict is over and Ukraine has to do something with its economy and Russia is going to be part of the solution. And uh, talk of a ceasefire, perhaps by the end of the week. Uh, you think that's likely? We'll see. It's, I, I'd be lying to you, Mike, if I told you that I knew how to answer that question. That depends on what the decision in Ukraine is going to be. The decision is not going to be made until the summit is over but the, because the Ukrainians are waiting to see what NATO will promise them. I don't think that's going to be terribly much. And I think that by the beginning of next week, we will see the first uh, moderate step towards um, uh, a peace plan. But what that's going to look like, no one knows. And as you mentioned, uh, and it's worth the repeating, uh, it's painful right now. There's fighting going on, but you suspect the pain increases once the fighting ends. I mean, is this, this is a, a country uh, that's racked with a really difficult will, economic be, situation. It will be much worse. I think the West is making a very dangerous mistake in taking the current war as the cause of Ukraine's troubles as opposed to a symptom of what is already there. There are deep structural economic problems. And what goes underreported in the West, for example, is that about 10 days ago, the Minister of Economic Development resigned. The head of the anti-corruption uh, body resigned in Ukraine. Both cited the, the, the inability of the government to push through any kind of economic reforms. The, the Ukrainian crisis is only beginning. All right. Anton, always a delight having you. And thanks so much for your analysis. Thank Appreciate you. It.